We interrupt your regularly scheduled programming. Currently, a massive meteorite is headed towards the Earth. All citizens are urged to click. Yeah, I don't really buy that. It's probably just some stunt. Eh, and if it isn't, the Power Rangers can handle it. They did it before. If not, we got superheroes. I'm uh, pretty sure Iron Man can handle that. Okay, uh, let's try Channel 2. And today on the anime Who Done It. Oh, damn it, I hate that show. They always spoil the ending before it gets started. Uh, let's try Channel 4. And today on Are You the Father. Ah, oh, god damn it, another freaking talk show. I hate those things. Oh, they are paternity tests. All right, let's try Channel 5. Um, Screwing with Chicken should soon be on. Screwing with Chickens will not be shown today so that we may bring you the absolutely, completely random podcast. Ah, eh, but then again, this show does sound a little more interesting. Eh, what the hell? Let's give it a shot. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Absolutely Completely Random Podcast for Saturday, May 4th, 2019. That's right. It is Star Wars Day, and it's a somber Star Wars Day, unfortunately, with the passing of Chewbacca. <sighs> May the Wookiee rest in peace. But either way, there is much better things to talk about than the death of a beloved actor. <clears throat> so much more. And... What do I have to talk about? Well, quite a lot. Sonic the Hedgehog is getting a massive redesign after fans pretty much ripped the trailer a brand new asshole, and I get to talk about that. Hoyuka, or Hoku, or however I've been pronouncing it incorrectly, apparently. Well, the manga is sadly coming to an end, and honestly, I loved the anime. I have not read the manga. I'm going to be talking about the upcoming death battle between Ben 10 and the Green Lantern. That's right. And Tommy Lee Jones' alien form on the Japanese Boss Coffee commercials has welcomed in the new Rewa era and bid a fond farewell to the Heisei era in his own special way. Yeah, you know, in case you didn't know that Tommy Lee Jones does coffee commercials in Japan. Hey, YouTube's good for a lot of things. And possibly more. You never know how this show goes. Anyway, you know the drill by now. This is the point when I usually talk about myself, but it's kind of a mute point by now. Everybody knows where to go and check stuff out. It's A-R-H-O-A-D-S hyphen 2012 on eBay for all your wide variety needs of trading cards, what have you, just weird stuff you may not have, or you may want a second one of, or you just need a conversation starter, you know, just weird things in general. Feel free to check out my eBay page. Don't forget, you can also follow me on Twitter at Otaku Roads, and you can also check out my Facebook page. That's right, the official Web Designer 18 Facebook page on Facebook, because Hey, it's the 21st century. Why am I not everywhere, right? All right, so uh, let's just get this off the bat here. How did my week go? Um, actually, I had a bit of an interesting week. Uh, an interesting little story to tell from last week that I remembered and I did not forget. I even wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. But then also, some massively exciting news happened this week. No, I'm not getting married. No, I did not find a girlfriend. And no, I did not win the lottery. Now that we've gotten the three things that basically killed my hopes and dreams out of the way, um, I actually have officially been told by YouTube as of Thursday morning at 9.14 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, or whatever the hell it would be, Greenwich Mean Time, or Greenwich, which Greenwich Means Time, and, you know, GMT or UTC, whatever you want to prefer it as, but I'm going with Eastern Standard Time, 9.14 in the morning, that I have officially hit... The 100 subscriber club on YouTube! Woo! 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 Yes! Yes, that's right. I have finally hit 100 subscribers here on YouTube, and I am actually ecstatic about this. Uh, thank you so much to everyone that subscribed. Thank you to everyone who leaves comments on my videos. I love reading them. They're always a lot of fun every video I look forward to the comments more than anything I mean my mom can even attest to that and it's the one thing I look forward to every single video it's like okay comments comments where are the comments every single video I look forward to them all the time it's I, I just love the comment section it's one of my favorites but yep I hit 100 subscribers this week so I am ecstatic about that but on top of that 
There is uh, some other good news on here. Uh, but I'll get into that when I talk about the uh, topics, as it were. But uh, the funny little story, though, that I get to tell everybody is uh, how last Sunday went. So, uh, my mom and I go down to this convenience store almost every night, get ourselves something to drink and maybe a snack every now and then. And we take the scenic route from time to time. And we took the scenic route last Sunday. And we're driving on the back roads, nice little scenic route. And all of a sudden, there's like this SUV that pulls up behind me. Now, you wouldn't really think much of this. I mean, backcountry road, you're figuring, meh, that's fine. Everybody's got to drive something. But this thing has, now my mom swears it had to be like a bike rack. I don't think it was a bike rack. But then again, what the hell do I know? Um, But anyway, this SUV has this rack on the top of it. If it was a bike rack, that was a really screwed up bike rack. But it is sticking out the side of the vehicle almost like two massively huge bull horns. And I mean like horns on an actual bull. I'm sitting in the car, I'm driving, and this thing comes up behind us. And all of a sudden I'm like... (laughs) I felt like it was the running of the bulls in Pamplona. The only issue was is that I'm in a car, and this thing's an SUV, and I still felt like I was going to get gored if I would have had to slam on my brakes. It was not pleasant <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. And I'm just, like, making this joke as we tur- as I quickly turn off. So I'm like, I don't want to get gored. And my mom's like, what? And I'm like, that SUV behind us, massively huge horns. It looked like it had, like, freaking bull horns on the top of the car. And she goes, oh, it's probably just a bike rack. I'm like, no, that's no bike. That's a bike rack? That can't be a bike rack. What type of a bike rack would that be? Uh, Happily, it didn't go the same way I went. Otherwise, that would have been really embarrassing. But I just thought that was quite amusing because it's like, what the hell? That is not something you expect to see all the time. And that was just Sunday. Uh, Monday was an all right day. Could have been a little better. Uh, Sorry for the noise if it's getting picked up on my microphone. There was a fundraiser across the street from where I live today, so they're cleaning up, and they make a lot of noise. And I have to crack the window open because it's really warm in my room now. So the stink bugs have been invited back inside temporarily. Um, But that was just Sunday. Monday was okay. Tuesday was a meh kind of day. Wednesday I worked. Thursday was another meh kind of day, with the exceptions of what I'm going to be talking about later on in the podcast here. And then yesterday, we had a little bit of a car issue with my grandfather's car crapping out and my mom having to call me to come pick her up. She went grocery shopping, his car crapped out, wouldn't start. We called the tow truck, and it's like, look, we want it towed to the garage. It won't start. We're cranking it over. It's not starting up. And the tow truck driver just comes and goes, oh, no, it's just your battery. We tried jumping it, and it didn't work. And it's like, oh, no, 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 it's just your battery. Hooks up a box to it. It has an automatic, like, a car starter on it. And hooks it up. And it's like, hooks the positive end on, puts the negative end onto the piece of metal. Now, granted, we did, you know, how you're normally, how, you know, some people jump a battery is they put negative to negative, positive to positive, and others put negative to ground. Either way is supposed to work. I haven't heard issues either way supposed to work. But apparently, no. Uh, Got put negative to ground, apparently. I got my head chewed off by the tow truck driver about that. Because I was doing it wrong. So he goes, he starts it, he gets starts right up. And the whole time I'm looking at the car and I'm like, you son of a bitch. Take it to the garage and the mechanic goes, oh yeah, battery's dead, but I can't get one till Monday. That's great. But if you let it sit overnight, the battery's going to die again. That's great. So I got that to look forward to this week, trying to get the battery charged up and try to find a replacement if I can. But yeah, so that was a nightmare in itself on Friday, and that led into a tremendous amount of stress. But it's not my mom's fault. It's the crappy car and the fact that the battery was going bad to begin with for a while now. We knew it was going bad. Why we didn't replace it, I will never know. But there was that. Um, And then today was sort of an all right day. It rained. Um... Picked up some movies at Walmart because I had to get a phone card. I picked up uh, the Blues Brothers 2-pack. We watched the original Blues Brothers movie. Not exactly something I would recommend for everybody, but it was a 2-pack, and I really wanted Blues Brothers 2000, and yeah. 
But other than that, though, let's get into the podcast, because it's going to be one heck of a week. Oh, it's going to be one heck of a week, isn't it? All right, so let's talk about the upcoming death battle. Uh, so this one was announced after the Wario versus King Dedede uh, death battle this past Wednesday. And honestly, it wasn't bad. Uh, though, in all honesty, I'm just going to say this. It was a battle between two gag characters, so you knew it was going to go one way or another. Now, yeah, I kind of was leaning a little more towards Dedede because I've seen Wario's fighting style. If they were basing it off of the Smash Brothers games. I've kind of seen what he can do. And honestly, I've battled against King Dedede. I've played a couple Kirby games. I've battled against King Dedede. I know what he brings to the table. So, yeah, it, I had a feeling it was going to go the way it went. But still, it was a good fight. I'm not going to lie. I enjoyed it. You get a little bit of tidbit and information on all the characters. So, you know, besides the fact. But, yeah, I, it was one of those you could kind of see the outcome, but you weren't 100% sure which way it was going to go. But the next death battle that they announced was Ben 10 versus the Green Lantern. Now, I am a huge fan of the Green Lantern. So much so, in fact, that I could recite the oath by memory alone. Um, in brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evils might be where my power Green Lantern's light. That's the, la that's the Green Lantern's oath. You say that while putting the Green Lantern ring up to your Power Lantern, and it'll recharge the ring. Now, I like the Green Lantern. In fact, I've constantly made the comment that if DC ever goes belly up, please, for the love of God, Marvel, get Green Lantern. Grab him, the Flash, and Mr. Freeze, and save their sorry asses, because they do not deserve to go into the pit, the bottomless pit that is uh, DC. And I know I'm going to get crap from DC fans for that. But honestly, those three characters can be saved. Hell, I'll even say throw Wonder Woman in because there aren't enough female superheroes in the Marvel end. Throw her in and I'll be fine with it. Otherwise, yeah, I'm a huge fan of the Green Lantern. I watched a lot of the I watched the uh, animated series when I had cable and it was on Cartoon Network. I actually watched the whole series, uh, you know, both of the seasons. So it was quite good. But when I found out that it's that the Green Lantern is going to be going up against Ben 10, this is going to be a death battle to end all death battles. Okay, it's not going to be like the massively epic death battles we've had in the past, like Iron Man versus Optimus Prime. Oh, no, that was a superpower beatdown. Um, yeah, it's not going to be like... Uh, well, it's not going to be like uh, Iron Man versus Lex Luthor, though that was a good fight. It's not going to be like Optimus Prime versus the RX-78-2. It's going to be a decent fight, but it's going to be one that's going to have a tremendous amount of uniqueness to it. Because Ben 10 has the ability to change into aliens. Granted, for about 10 minutes at a time, if I remember the lore correctly, hence why he's called Ben 10. You know, besides the fact that he was 10 years old, then he grew to be 15 years old, and yeah. And I'd like to thank Cap, um, yeah, my one uh, subscriber, my one uh, viewer, Cap, who informed me that, according to the Death Battle cast uh, show, they are going to be giving Ben 10 everything. So, this opens up a tremendous floodgate of possibilities. Because for Ben 10, you had the original Ben 10 series, you had Alien Force, you had Omniverse, you had uh, Ultimate Alien... Oh, sorry, there was Ultimate Alien, then Omniverse. Then you had... Um, what the hell was... Oh, then that newer one that came out, and honestly, that's where I stopped watching after Omniverse. And the kicker is that Omniverse is one of my favorites because, yes, while it did kind of make the show look a little more childish, it didn't have that dark feel to it that Alien Force and Ultimate Alien had. Ultimate Alien and Alien Force just kind of gave this feeling of you know, it, this is a more adult storyline, and we somehow got this green lit because Ben 10's popular as hell right now. And that's honestly how I felt about it. But if Ben Tennyson's going up against the Green Lantern, I was wondering which Green Lantern it was. Because you had um, Hal Jordan, then there was John, whose last name escapes me off the top of my head, and then there was Guy Gardner. So it's like, which Green Lantern are they going up against? And 
based off of the pictures and from what Cap told me, it's supposed to be Hal Jordan. So hopefully um, that's right and it's 100% accurate. Because if it's Hal Jordan, Ben 10 may not have a chance. Keep in mind, Hal Jordan's ring is technically the original green one of the original Green Lantern rings, if you remember the one story in the one Green Lantern uh, animated movie, where the original ring that he had, one of the original rings that was given out at the start of the Lantern Corps, was actually the ring that Hal Jordan uses now. The one that Abin Sur had prior to his death, leading to Hal Jordan getting it. Therefore, it's one of the original rings. So that's sort of an interesting construct, the fact that he has one of the original rings. Not only that, but he has experience using it. He knows that it needs willpower in order to work correctly. The only limitations are your imagination and until the battery in the ring runs dry. You know, the AAA batteries in that thing only last for so damn long. However, Ben Tennyson also has a massive amount of power as well. Besides the fact that he has access to Alien X, which is one of his strongest aliens, it's also a double-edged sword. I was explaining this in a comment section. While Alien X is extremely powerful, one of the issues it has is the fact that even though it's powerful, you need to have a majority rule. In Alien Force and Ultimate Alien, Ben couldn't get the two halves to agree on anything and was stuck in a stalemate, and therefore Alien X was stuck basically in limbo. Um, so there was that. Paradox got him out of it by uh, jumping in there and pulling him out of Alien X and pulling him out of the Alien X form so that he could actually finally, you know, do something and help. But still, you had that. In Omniverse, though, he actually looked at him and said, look, I don't care what the two of you do. Battle it out in the background. Give me the keys to Alien X with the power so I can at least fight this guy so we don't die. Because he was in the middle of getting uh, stuck in, stuck on trial uh, by that alien species for, I guess, interfering with stuff. I don't remember the whole episode off the top of my head. But there was that. So if he has access to Alien X, he's getting everything, which means he'll have Alien X, even if it's just from Alien Force, you know, down. If he has access to Alien X's full power, he could technically take Green Lantern on, and he might be able to beat him, no questions asked. But if he doesn't have control of Alien X, forget it. All he'll have access to, if we're going Alien Force and below, would be Swamp Fire, Jet Ray... Spider Monkey, Echo Echo, um, what the hell is the blue one, uh, the moth one, the ice something or other, um, ice moth or something, I forget the name of it, and if we're going with the original, because keep in mind, when Alien Force started, he didn't have access to the original ten that were Diamond Head, Forearm, Stinkfly, um, Gray Matter, Wild Mutt, then you got Cannonbolt after Ghost Freak was removed. Um, oh, what were some of the other ones? Oh, there's so many aliens over time, too. I mean, there was Goop. From, there was Goop, I think it was like an ultimate alien. You had Goop, Humongosaur, uh, Chromastone. So many aliens. So if he has access to all of them, he might have a chance by having a wide variety because if he has the Omniverse aliens, he'll have uh, the Gremlin one, he'll have Upgrade, he'll have Gray Matter so he can think of a plan to get out of it, he'll have Upgrade that he can basically find some type of robotic weaponry and upgrade it and use it to his advantage to help, like if Hal Jordan has a ship or something. He has access to Forearms, Wild Mutt, Cannonbolt, Diamond Head, I don't think he can do Chromastone anymore because I think he had to sacrifice that one. Uh, way big. Come on. Way big. Humongosaur. Um, Echo Echo. There's so many of them. Uh, feedback. Will pro he'll probably use Feedback definitely if he has access to Omniverse Aliens. Feedback will probably be his go-to one because it can probably just take the Green Lantern Ring's uh, energy attacks and just shoot them right back to Hal Jordan. Uh, and Alien X. Not to mention, if he has some of the other ones seen near the end of Omniverse, like uh, Atomics, which is pretty powerful. 
Um, and if he has the access, the power of Ben 10,000, where he can basically, like, his future self combine two of the aliens together um, and do Atomic X, forget it. That's going to be the end of it. Because you'll have Alien X's powers mixed with Atomic's powers, and there goes Green Lantern. There ain't nothing that's going to save him. Now, if Green Lantern, though, in turn is going to have his full powers, and I'm talking what he had in the movie Green Lantern First Flight, where we're talking he basically had a Super Saiyan green aura to him, yeah, he could pretty much take on an entire planet and live to tell the tale. I mean, if we're talking massive power boost here, it's possible. Um, but it's just going to be one of those we'll have to wait and see sort of deal, see what's going to happen. Now, personally, I'm looking forward to this. I, like I said, I like the Green Lantern. I like Ben 10. Both of those shows and characters are highly unique and wonderful. Yes, I'm not a humongous fan of Alien Force. I am. That's one of the, in my opinion, weakest of the series next to the newest one that came out, whatever the hell it's called, Ben 10 something or other. Omniverse is one of my favorites because of the fact that you just had the wide variety of aliens that came out along with it. Uh, the more unique storyline. Yes, he was a little more cocky in this one, but in all honesty, the teenage Ben we had in Alien Force wasn't as cocky as a teenager would be. He was more driven because he had a mission to fulfill, and as far as he was concerned, he was the leader. He had to basically do and think like an adult. So even though he had you know teenage hormones driving him insane, he had to ignore them and try his damnedest to be the leader. Whereas, Omniverse Ben, okay, I don't really gotta be a leader, I'm just a plumber agent, I'm not really in charge of anything, and problem solved. So, yeah, I, I know why people are pissed off about it, but that's, still, it's a screw you type of moment there, it really is. But anyway, I'm looking forward to this fight, um, but like I said, it could go, this is one of those that's on the seesaw teeter edge. Because it could go one way or another. Like I said, if Ben 10 has access to Alien X, and I mean full control of Alien X, it could go Ben 10's way. But if Ben 10 doesn't have control of Alien X and gets stuck in Alien X's form, he's screwed. Because he can't do anything until either the timer runs out or he finds a way to trigger it and get himself out of it. And I highly doubt they're going to have outside influences on here, since they never really do, so... You won't have uh, Kevin Eleven or Gwen helping him, and Paradox sure as hell ain't going to show up to yank his ass out of Alien X's uh, dimension that point in time. So, yeah. And I doubt he's going to have his uh, friend from, or his partner from Omniverse. Oh, his name escapes me at the moment. But, yeah, so definitely not going to have probably any help with this. He's going to be flying solo. He could do it. But like I said, if he's going to have everything, we're talking everything from Ben 10 to Ben 10 Alien Force or Ultimate Alien, uh, as long as he doesn't turn into Alien X, he won't have a problem. But if we're going up to Omniverse, may not have that big of an issue because if he has control of it. But if we're talking like older Ben, like he has access to the ability to fuse his aliens together like his older self did, then we have a chance. If he can combine some of the aliens together. Older Self knew which two aliens to combine to make a decent attack. Atomics and Alien X was for, okay, we're talking Quasar black hole level, you know, enemy here. I got to bring out the big guns. Atomic X is where I got to go. But if we're talking, oh, this is just some simplistic idiot. Yeah, I'm just going to go Humongous or mixed with Diamond Head or something. You know, intermatch, you know, my massive amount of aliens and just combine two of them together. Oh, Big Chill. That's what it was called. Big Chill. I just thought of it. The name of the, the name of the moth one. I think you had Arctic Guana from the first season. So, yeah. It all depends on which aliens they're going to have Ben 10 have, how far up the series they're going to go, if they are giving him everything, which I'm hoping they are. But, like I said, according to Cap, uh, according to the Death Battle cast, they're supposed to be giving him everything. But they can change their mind, too, up until it actually comes out. So that's not coming out till like the end of uh, May. So yeah, the, things could change. But either way, I'm looking forward to this fight. I'm looking forward to this death battle. It's going to be a massive death battle. This one's going to be good. Uh, it's probably going to be one of my favorites that I'll like it on Facebook. The moment it drops, I want to watch it. So yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. 
Okay, so like many of you, I was made aware of the Sonic the Hedgehog trailer dropping Tuesday afternoon. And honestly, it was not pleasant. Uh, I saw the trailer. I put my thoughts into words in an actual video rant that I quickly did because I was recording at the time an episode of the Anime GBU. So I'm like, let me just quick record this and be done with it. So I just recorded a video one and quickly uploaded it. I was planning to do a full-on rant video then about it. However, Paramount, the director behind this movie, and Sega sucked the wind out of my sails, uh, as it were. I mean, I can still do a rant just on that part, but they've announced that they are going to be fixing Sonic's design. And this is after the fans threw bitch fit after complaint after complaint on their ass since the trailer dropped. Now, images were leaked prior to this trailer of Eggman, Jim Carrey, uh, sorry, Jim Carrey's character of Robotnik slash Eggman, Sonic's design and everything else, and fans were like, please tell me this isn't real. And then when the trailer drops, it was god-awful. Um, th this thing was garnered as, like, massive hate fuel. So many fans were immediately taking to YouTube to do trailer reactions, but I think the worst part of this is the fact that uh, a lot of them were getting copyright strikes because the trailer has Gangster's Paradise, the song um, by Coolio that plays during the trailer. So, of course, YouTube's copyright bot was instantly tracking that thing down like, oh my god, you're using copyrighted music in your video, and boom! Down goes Frazier, as it were, and their videos were getting copyright struck. Because uh, Angry Joe brought this to a lot of people's attention because he quick did a, a, reaction a reaction to the trailer. And he's going, and I got ner he goes, I got news and uh, words from other um, YouTubers that they're getting copyright claims because Gangster's Paradise plays. So I'm going to be trying to mute the audio in this as best I can. And he did do a good job. However, some of the songs still played. Uh, I know Pat the NES Punk and Ian Ferguson, so Pat Contry and Ian Ferguson over on the CU Podcast, did a quick trailer reaction too uh, during this week's podcast episode. And they just kind of let it play. And I, the first comment I made is, well, here comes the copyright bot. And I'm kind of making the joke that maybe Ian will pull the uh, Gandalf from Lord of the Rings and go, you shall not pass and stop the copyright bot from trying to attack him. <laughs> so I think somebody got a kick out of that anyway. Uh, but yeah, so this was the first trailer for the Sonic the Hedgehog live action movie. It came out and fans were not happy about it. Um, it was revolting to see the least of it. Um, I actually felt a little queasy to my stomach. I even put down in my rant video, bring a barf bag. Because honestly, Sonic's design is god-awful. And just going off of how bad the trailer was in general, uh, and I said this in my rant video that we'll, yet no one will ever see. I mean, I have the audio yet, but there's really no point in me putting it up now anymore because they've agreed to fix it. Now, if I put it up and I decide to put it up, there'll be like a disclaimer at the front of it stating that, you know, this was recorded prior to the announcement that the design was going to be changed, which I might do, but that's something I'm really going to have to think about. But anyway, uh, the fans were not happy about this. Um, so basically, I'm assuming they got a whole crap ton of shit on this. It's like, look, the trailer sucks, the design is god-awful, what the hell were you smoking? How do you screw up Sonic the Hedgehog? And uh, director Jeff Fowler has heard the feedback, and in fact, in a rare movie, uh, Fowler not only acknowledged all the fan criticisms, he hopped onto Twitter and sold and said changes will be made to design to address them. They are still shooting yet for the November release, as of the last that I heard, as of the recording of this podcast. Um, they do have a trailer, though, in the article showing this. But fans immediately started cracking up their own designs for how to improve Sonic. And the fan designs are better than the actual movie. Which leads back to my original question, how the hell did you screw this up? I don't understand that. Uh, so many people have been taking on to this and everything else. Um, but yeah, but time's just going to tell how much they can do between now and November. 
Hopefully it won't be at the cost of an exhaust and exhausting a bunch of already overworked designers and animators, which is another main thing that people have been going on about online. You've had fans that have been going, well, wait a minute, we can't exactly, you know, request this from them because all these animators are overworked, they're underpaid, they're not getting enough of this. However, here's my question for this. Now, I can, I, I want to safely ask this question. This kind of feels to me like they had this set in the back pocket already. It's almost like, look, people were pissed off back when those posters got leaked and revealed for the Sonic movie. And you saw these long blue legs and you saw Sonic standing really tall. So you kind of already had a feeling like you knew what was going to happen prior to the trailer getting released. Then when the trailer finally drops... The fandom just takes off like a freaking firestorm from hell and starts ripping the director a new one. And it's like, look, this is god-awful. This is inhuman. This is ugly as hell. And now all of a sudden, like over a day later, like basically about a day and a half later, it's, I've heard your complaints. We're going to redesign Sonic. You have six months till this movie comes out at best. And you're going to use six months to redesign a character from scratch. Not delay the film or anything, which is what a lot of fans were thinking. Well, they're just going to delay the film and fix this. Nope, they're still, as of this recording, shooting for the November release. So, it leaves you to wonder, what the hell are they smoking that they're going to do this? I mean, what's going to possess them to do this and do this correctly? And therein lies my question of, did they already have this plan from the start? It's like I said, the posters got revealed and people were getting a little uppity. When the trailer gets revealed, the uppityness just completely goes batshit crazy like a forest fire out of control. And now all of a sudden, here's the massive flood that's basically, look, we're going to fix the design. Here's the flood to calm the fire. And now all of a sudden, it's like, good, that took care of it. And it's almost like it was going according to plan, like they played all the fans like a fiddle. I'm not going to lie, it's what it feels like. Because they they attempt this way too lightly. I mean, with the creator and the director, sorry, with the director pretty much going, uh, the tweet here is actually on here, um, thank you for the support and the criticism. The message is loud and clear. You aren't happy with the design and you want changes. It's going to happen. Everyone at Paramount and Sega are fully committed to making this character the best he can be. Hashtag Sonic Movie, hashtag Gotta Fix Fast. So, this got put out on May 2nd, which was Thursday, 5 p.m. on May 2nd. The trailer dropped on April 30th. So, there's a massive um thing here. And like I said, this seems way too quick and way too easy of a response. Sort of like... Yeah, we heard you. I mean, I would have expected more from uh, the director of this. I would have been like, yeah, I heard you, but budget constraints, time-wise, we don't have enough time to fix the movie, so there's nothing we can do. But going out and saying, we've heard what you want, everyone at Paramount and Sega are fully committed to fixing this, kind of makes me think they already had this planned from the start. And it does make a lot of sense that way. It's almost like uh, the whole Teen Titans go to the movies thing where they were dangling the prospect of season six in front of you. Should you go see this and it does well, they'll give you season six. I personally don't think they ever really planned on doing season six. And if they did, it sure as hell wasn't going to be on Cartoon Network, but was probably going to be on their own streaming service if they do do it. That being said, with this, it seems more like, look, the fans are going to throw a fit if we redesign Sonic. They're already pissed off at live-action movies based off of video games. Look at the Mario Brothers. Detective Pikachu might just be the saving grace, but we're coming out after that movie's going to have been out. You had uh, World of Warcraft that tanked, not to mention a few other ones. So, why should we bother trying to design Sonic in a new way? Let's just go to the other way. But... Because they're expecting us to have Sonic look like crap, let's give them Sonic looking like crap so that they'll have a whole different Sonic. Then when they throw a fit, we'll give them the changed 
back to the original Sonic that we were planning all along. It's not that far-fetched, and honestly, I think that's the direction that they were heading. And if it is, that's dirty and underhanded even by their standards. I'm happy that they've admitted that they screwed up and that they're going to fix it, but it just seemed like it was way too convenient of them to say, yeah, we're going to fix Sonic for you. It's not a problem. Just give us six months and it'll be ready by the time the movie starts. Something's a little weird with that. I mean, I don't think I'm reading too much into this, but something just feels a little off by that. I don't know what it is. But, yeah, so they are fixing the design. Um, hopefully, it'll be better. Only time's really going to tell at this point, but... Yeah, something just doesn't feel right about this. I just can't put my finger on what exactly it is. Okay, so let me take you on this little magical journey I like to call Andrew Land. Where in Andrew Land, any anime series he watches, he kind of enjoys. Unless it sucks, or it's called Fruit Baskets, or Dragon Ball GT. Or just something that really sucks. But let me just take you into this magical world where I stumbled upon a unique anime series that apparently I've been mispronouncing all these years. Ah, uh, I don't care. It was still a good. It was still a good series, and it's actually going to be one that I'm probably going to plan on doing for the anime GBU before the end of season one. So yeah, look forward to that. Anyway, the anime was called Hokua. H-Y-O-U-K-A. Apparently I've been mispronouncing it this entire time, but bite me. It's either called Hoyuka or however I've been saying it and apparently mispronouncing it. Here's the thing, I'm not perfect and nobody really is in the world, so yeah. Anyway, the manga adaptation of this has still been going on, however it's now coming to an end. The final volume is going to be coming out on May 25th, comprising 12 volumes in total. So, this is honestly sort of an interesting concept. Now, this has been running in Shonen Ace since 2012, the same year the novel was transformed into an anime series by Kyoto Animation. It also inspired a live-action film, which I haven't actually watched. I have heard about it. It looked good. I'm not going to lie. I just actually haven't gotten around to watching it. Then again, it's basically a detective series based on a slice of lifestyle show dealing with a mystery. So you can't really screw it up. Seriously, it's, it's unscrewable, really. So live action will work for that. However, Funimation describes the anime as follows. Um, Hokua, or Hoyuka, or however I'm mispronouncing this thing tells the story of the disenchanted high school boy, Hotoro Oriki. Rarely one to go out of his way to do anything for anyone else, Oriki is pressured by his older sister to join the school's classic literature club in order to keep it from being abolished. There he meets Iru... Hold on a second, I gotta scroll up here. Iru Chitanda, a kind-hearted and inquisitive girl who's joined the Classics Club for personal reasons. Oriki is immediately drawn to her, but finds her endless energy a little overwhelming. After the pair is joined by Oriki's best friend, Fukube, and the fiery Ibera, the club is complete. Left to their own devices, the four students quickly get off track when Oriki's talent for solving mysteries sparks Chitanda's boundless curiosity. She has a mystery of her own to share, but first, she needs to make sure Oriki is the right man for the job. I plan on doing a massive anime GBU for this, because this was a really good anime series, and it ended on a very good note. So, I don't really want to dive too much into the plot of this, doing this simple, you know topic here for the podcast but this is honestly a good series and i really do appreciate the fact that it's had a manga form now i'm gonna have to see if it's out in english because i'm gonna probably want to get this for me uh i still have a bit of a manga collection i still find some every now and then that are interesting to me so i'm gonna have to see if this is out that i can get all 12 volumes and see if i can get them relatively cheap i mean i got a complex age on ebay 
honestly cheaper than I thought I would. So this shouldn't be that big of a, you know, that big of a difficulty. Either way, I'm definitely looking forward to this ending so I can see how the ending plans out. Now, Funimation did do a did do an English dub of this. However, I've only seen the um, Japanese voices with English subtitles. And either way, the series is good. I do like it. And like I said, I do plan on doing a massive uh, GBU episode for this. It's going to be pretty cool. This might actually be the season finale, but I'm not sure yet. But either way, this is a good series. And for it to accomplish the feat of 12 volumes is something to be monumentally proud of. Um, out of all the manga that I've read that I actually own physical copies of that I went out of my way to buy, the only two series that I have that have gone double digits besides mainstream shonen series were Eyes at 15 and Bakuman at 20. Now, Iken did have 18 volumes. However, only up to volume 12 was released in English, with 13 through 18 being left pretty much in the dust. Thank you, Media Blasters, for dropping the ball on that one. Never going to forgive him for that. Um, I have, you know, because I had a couple case closed. Um, Full Metal Alchemist went up a little bit, but I didn't have all of it. So out of the ones that I have completed collections of, or at least that I have in my box o manga, or my container o manga that I have in my room, um, the only two that I have that went double digits full series were, like I said, Eyes at 15 and Bakuman at 20. So either way, it's still quite an impressive feat when a series hits double digits. Um, at least it didn't go the way of uh, Picasso and only last, what, what the hell was it, like three volumes and then it was done. Um, I mean, some series are short. Legends was only like four volumes, but at least it had a complex story that it wrapped up in four volumes, so it at least knew what it was doing. Um, I had some, like, standalone ones that lasted a pretty decent amount of time, and I already mentioned Iken being a series that it worked itself in quite well. Uh, Dot Hack Legend of the Twilight was only three volumes long, but to be fair, there wasn't really much of that, and the three volumes did wrap up the whole series quite nicely. So, yeah, I understand the complex of where it came from. But the fact that this is hitting 12 volumes is a feat, especially nowadays with manga going digital. If we actually have 12 volumes of it, that's a... It's, honestly, that's a clap-worthy moment there. It really is. Congratulations. I can't uh, stress that one enough. So, yeah, uh, if you're in the mood for checking this out, uh, the manga's coming to an end with uh, Volume 12 due out on May 25th. Uh, I'm going to try to check this thing out. If I can, I'll try to see if I can find it. But either way, it's worth your time and effort. There is an English dub for it by Funimation, so it is worth your time checking out. I am planning a GBU on it, so if you just want to be patient and wait for that to come out, feel free. So, yeah, either way. It's interesting. I'm impressed. I'm excited. I'm happy. It did. It's done good. I, I'm. I'm really proud of it. I really, really am. I, I'm damn proud. Okay, so I bet you didn't know that Tommy Lee Jones does some commercials over in Japan. Like a lot of celebrities, he endorses a product overseas. In this case, it's Boss Coffee, and with the Heisei era sadly coming to an end and the Rewa era beginning, first off, I can't wait to see what the first Kamen Rider series of the Rewa era is going to be, since the one that was out near the end of the Heisei era, I'm considering with the Heisei era, so I can't wait for the first one of the Rewa era. Let's see what that one's going to be. But basically, because a uh, former emperor, now Emperor Emeritus Akihito, uh, ended his reign on May 1st when his son Naruhito took over. Uh, the Rewa era has taken over from the Hens from the Heisei era. So you had uh, television reports, news outlets were going crazy about this. Articles were and listed were posted looking back in the 30 years. Uh, but perhaps none were as charming as the Boss Coffee commercial starring Tommy Lee Jones as an alien in the form of Tommy Lee Jones. So, before I get into this, first off, I love Japanese commercials with American actors. These are funny as hell. Or even just actors in general. 
um, that do like a lot of American type movies or just movies that you wouldn't expect to see them pitching something in Japan. These are funny as hell. I love these commercials. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger did a Go West coffee commercial. You can pull that up on YouTube to find. Um, he did some Nissan Noodle commercials that I thought kind of sucked. And then he did some weird, um, I don't know if it was an energy drink or if it was like alcohol shots or what the hell it was. Um, there's like Bwee Bwee. I, I don't know what the hell it was. I think it was like an energy drink. I, I swear to God, I think it was an energy drink. But uh, the Go West commercial for him had to be one of my favorites. It fit him perfectly. Uh, the commercial is actually in the article, though, for this Tommy Lee Jones one. I'm not going to play it, but you can play it for yourself when you look at the article. Link is always in the description. So, Japanese commercial fans will recognize the long-running shtick, though, of Tommy Lee Jones, since he's been a boss spokesman for years. Uh, he basically plays an alien who, uh, takes, who took the form of Tommy Lee Jones in order to better understand human beings. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he looks back on the Heisei era and concludes that while humans are strange, irrational creatures, we sure do work hard and make some good coffee, of course. Uh, by the way, just, you know, in case anyone's interested, according to the article, that coffee is now incidentally available worldwide, or at least stateside. So if you'd actually like to try Boss Coffee and your drink coffee, I don't. As far as I'm concerned, that's nasty crap. I tried some when I was a kid, and I never got a taste for it again. Uh, you can get some at Stateside. So, um, here's hoping, though, that Tommy Lee Jones is going to continue his bizarreness that is the uh, coffee-drinking alien for years to come. I mean, th this guy is just so funny. So, hopefully, long into the Rewa era, we hope that he will continue his efforts to be the coffee-drinking alien from the Boss commercials. But seriously, though, I mean, these Japanese commercials are hilariously funny. Because, I mean, I've seen the Arnold Schwarzenegger one. I've seen Tommy Lee Jones's uh, Alien one. They're all funny. Uh, they're really humorous. They're really good to see. They're fun to watch. I get a huge kick out of them. I mean, seriously, I, I don't expect many people to understand it, But it's just that interesting of a series of commercials that it just tickles my funny bone. It really does. Um, but yeah, so here's hoping that Tommy Lee Jones continues these commercials for a long time to come, because I want to see more of them, damn it. I want to see more of you uh, being Mr. Jones, the coffee-drinking alien that observes us, because I think that is so funny and cool. Okay, despite what people think, Tommy Lee Jones is not that bad of an actor, so yeah, keep going with the Japanese commercials. They're great, they really are. Holy crap, do I have a bonus, bonus, topic, topic of, of the week, 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 week. Yes, I actually do have a bonus topic of the week. It's a strange occurrence nowadays for me to actually have a bonus topic to talk about. And this time around, I'm talking about Hello Kitty making a guest appearance on Crayon Shin-Chan. Now, for those of you who haven't been made aware or have been living under a rock recently, Hello Kitty has begun a collaboration with Mobile Suit Gundam. Um, I actually talked about this. The first uh, visual of it dropped, at least the preview of it. I've seen it. There's a link in my original uh, podcast episode where I talked about it. So, yeah. Uh, Hello Kitty's really getting um, out there in the world. But going on to Creon Shin-Chan... I got some questions about that. So Hello Kitty's 45th anniversary tour continues with the Sanrio mascot's next stop involving paying a visit to children's TV anime Crayon Shin-Chan. Kitty will be featured in the first episode of Japan's new Rewa era, which starts on May 1st. So it's already aired. Figures. Oh, no, okay, the episode itself is set to air on May 10th. Okay, so I'm still six days ahead. All right. <laughs> uh, the Kitty Chan versus Buri Chan Daza episode will be set in the Sanrio-themed indoor park Poroland, in which Hello Kitty bumps into an imposter named Buri Chan. Can't make this crap up. Together with Shinosuke, Hello Kitty aims to take down this new rival. Aha. Uh, 
Uh, this isn't the first time, though, that Hello Kitty has teamed up with Crayon Shin Chan as part of the 45th anniversary celebration. Earlier this year, uh, Sanrio, and I'm probably mispronouncing that, by the way, announced a collaboration that included a one-shot manga, goods, and more. In case you missed it, Hello Kitty's crossover with Mobile Suit Gundam recently kicked off with an intense promo. <laughs> yeah, intense. Uh, I got some questions regarding that, too, but I'll leave those to myself. But my question uh, with this is, now, I've seen uh, Shin-Chan. I, uh, I've seen this series. This is not a series for kids. This is like teenager to late adult, mostly for the humor and crudeness that it has. Now, unless they have a different Shin-Chan in Japan, and we got the uh, more mature-themed one over here in the States when they started airing it on Adult Swim, um, I got some major complaints about Hello Kitty magically appearing on this show all of a sudden as part of a collaboration. This is the same Shin-Chan, I'm assuming, that basically, um... Uh, let me put it to, let me put it to you this way. If this series would take place in this day and age, in this part of the country, localized entirely within the scope of anime as we know it, anyone watching it would find themselves on an FBI watch list in a matter of seconds. On top of that, you would also have yourself on a number of sites listing you as possibly not a good person to have around children. The whole prospect of this show is the fact that Shin is basically, uh, he's like a kindergartner. He doesn't understand the world, yet he thinks he does. His biggest uh, show that he likes watching is Action Bastard. And one of the most annoying things he does is an ass dance, or occasionally just whipping out his, you know, thing and basically dancing around like it's an elephant. It's one of the stupidest shows that Adult Swim ever had, yet some of the stuff in it is funny if you can get past, and I mean literally get past 90% of it, it's a funny show. When they got away from the crude humor of it, it's definitely an interesting show. Yes, they had an entire spinoff for Star Wars uh, that really sucked ass. They had a... Uh, well, they have an action bastard. That was a kind of funny thing. You have a uh, happiness bunny. <laughs> I'm still gonna kick out of that thing. Happiness bunny's revenge, and so many other like uh, prospects from the show. But yeah, some of the stuff on the show I feel like would get a lot of people uncomfortable. And the thing was that when it aired, at least over here in the states, it aired late at night. We're talking like midnight, 12:30 at the latest. It aired. So it's not like a series that, oh, it's just basically going to re-air or it's going to be on at like 8 o'clock at night. No, this was an after dark type of show. And you could see why. There, This thing was adult. I mean, full-blown adult. But the problem is, like I said, nowadays, instantaneous. Boom, you're on a watch list. Boom, you're on a watch list. Boom, you're on a watch list. FBI is knocking down your front door. And that's the sad part about it. Now, unfortunately, for those of us that have seen it, we've seen it. That's the problem. Uh, that old adage always goes, once something has been seen, it can never be unseen. So this is not a series that you would expect Hello Kitty to join. Now, like I said, unless there's another series that I'm missing somewhere, um, this is the same show, right? Because <laughs> if there's a series that I'm missing... And this is like a one that's designed for kids. Um, I think Japan and I need to have a serious heart-to-heart -heart talk. But seriously, though, this is just weird by all standards of weird. Now, yes, I get the whole Hello Kitty's 45th anniversary thing. They want to combine Hello Kitty with a bunch of different anime series. This is not one I would combine it with. Like I stated with the reasons why... There's a whole chunk of them. But, like I said, we may have gotten the more adult-oriented one here in the States, whereas this could be more kid-friendly in Japan. Though why you would change the aspect of a show that greatly, I don't know. Still, though, not exactly something that I would recommend for children, 
especially ones that like Hello Kitty, unless Hello Kitty's, like, vastly doing some weird stuff now, 45 years into this. Uh, I don't think Hello Kitty is, so no, not something I would recommend for children. Then again, what the hell do I know? Strange stuff occurs, I'll safely say that. But yes, I mean, like I said, Creation Chan is an okay show. If you can avoid the stuff that would bug the hell out of you or get you stuck on a watch list, there is some goodness to this show. It's basically a touching story about family. It's an interesting aspect to see how the world looks from the mind of a three-year-old. It's an interesting, uh, I'm assuming he's three or four, he's in kindergarten either way. So you figure either way, it's just interesting to see how the show goes from this, and you're seeing the world from the mindset of this young kid, who doesn't have any, you know, clue as to, oh, this is a bad thing I'm doing, versus why are you doing that? Worse for the fact is, why are we being shown it? But there is that. But either way, Hello Kitty combining with Crayon Shin-Chan, um, not a smart move in my opinion. I, I don't think that was a good combination. But then again, like I said, what in the holy hell do I know, right? Wait a minute, do I have another bonus, bonus, topic, topic of, of the week, 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 week? I do actually have another bonus topic of the week. And this time, it's about Gunpla sales. That's right. Uh, the number of Gunpla models shipped has surpassed 500 million. 500 million, as Dr. Evil would say. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. Um, so have you ever wondered how many plastic Gundam models or Gunpla exist in the world? Well, apparently it's over 500 million. It's over 500 million! If Vegeta would do that, that would be... Screw it, at that point, he'd be screwed. Uh, if anybody gets the Dragon Ball Z reference, uh, him and Nappa would have been turning tail, running, and peeing themselves as they were flying out of there. <laughs> so there is that. Uh, Gunpla first debuted back in July of 1980 with the 1 to 144 scale model of the original RX-78-2 Gundam. There are now over 2,000 variations according to uh, Mantan Web. It's a, um, I guess, a website that uh, calculates this stuff. According to Bandai Spirits, if you lined up the packages of every model sold to date, they'd wrap around the Earth four and a half times and weigh about 350,000 pounds. That's a lot of Gunpla. That's a lot of model. And honestly, I think that's a lot of bullshit. Uh, there have been many improvements and variations in the line over the years, including the 1987, or sorry, including in 1987 when Bandai re-released, or sorry, released the first model that could snap together without glue. So yeah, okay, I, that was my fault. My eyes were getting a little blurry there. They released the first model back in 1987 that you didn't have to glue together, and they actually have a uh, picture comparison here in the article. And honest to God, uh, it's night and day. Uh, the one on the left side, I'm guessing, is one from 1980. And the one on the right is fairly newer and looks a hell of a lot better than that one. And this one has the panel lines drawn in it because you can see it. It has the extra uh, detail put into it that I tried doing with my uh, Endless Waltz. Um, Wing Zero model kit, which I don't think I did very well. But then again, that was my first attempt, and I always liked Wing Zero. And I can always get another one because I found them on I found it on eBay. So I can always get a replacement. It's not that difficult. In 2010, the number of units shipped reached 400 million, and now nine years later, it's over 500 million. So hopefully, the next 40 years of plastic model kits is gonna be humongously great. At this rate, I mean, it has nowhere else to go but up. People are buying these things in droves. Uh, there's an entire competition yet over in Japan, at least the best of my knowledge, it's still going on, where you can actually build these things and effectively um, show them off to people. So it is kind of cool in that aspect that, hey, you know, this is actually going on. Hey, you can do this with the models. Um, we're not 
at the point yet where we can do anything. But I think the massive uptake for these model kits suddenly taking off had to do with the Gundam Build uh, franchises. We had Gundam Build Fighters, Build Fighters Try, and then Build Divers. Definitely helped out a lot with this since people were like, look, I can make something cool from the show by combining this Gundam with this Gundam, and I can do that by customizing it because they did a really cool rendition on the show or I want this one from the show and they have it as a model kit. So, yeah, it's definitely within the realm of possibility that that probably helped the massive uptake that was the you know, the model kit boom for it. So still, it's an interesting thing, and I highly am grateful for it. I mean, I own a Gundam model kit. In fact, it's like the third or fourth one I own. I did own one years prior when I was in, like, sixth grade, but I broke that one, sadly, by playing with it too roughly. But still, I had some. They are fun to put together. I'm not going to lie about that. They're a blast to put together. So, yeah, here's the 500 million Gunpla. I mean, damn, that's a lot of Gunpla. That's a lot of plastic. That is a lot of fun. Really. Alrighty, everybody. And that's going to do it this week for the Absolutely Completely Random Podcast. This has been a blast. I hope everybody had a fun-filled time. And I hope you look forward to a lot of the fun stuff I talked about or didn't talk about or just glanced on. However you prefer it. But either way, I hope everybody had a blast this week. And don't forget, if you have any topics you'd like to hear me talk about, feel free to drop them in one of three places. Either here on the discussion page of my YouTube channel, over on my Otaku Roads website, or Otaku or Totaku, or however you pronounce it, uh, Twitter page, I should say, not website, Twitter page, uh, at Otaku Roads, or on the Web Designer 18 Facebook page, because it's a lot of fun to have a lot of technology in the 21st century. And until next time, I'm Andrew Rhodes. This has been the Absolutely Completely Random Podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. And until next week, stay gold, stay good, and I'll catch you later. Bye, everybody.